Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me back uh, again this year. And, um, okay, great. Yes, so what did they do? This is a sort of a follow on from last year and talking about some of the lessons learned. Because the fact is, uh, although it is, you know, somewhat uh, new to some people in some areas, there are a lot of different environments in which, the, you know, the, the cross media uh, type of experience has been explored in, in cinema and in, in gaming, in literature and radio and theatre. Um, and so when, what I like to look at is basically what are the sort of emerging lessons that we can learn uh, from all of them. And so today, and now, I'll just close that. Yeah, so basically I'm going to draw on, on those. One of the things that people say to me is like, oh, isn't this just, um, just another hype, you know, another thing that will be coming into the industry and it's, it's going to be passing again? Yeah, sure. I mean, in some circumstances, it has been overhyped in the sense that it will replace everything that has ever been. I mean, it won't. It'll basically be co-present with a lot that has already been. Um, and lots of people are basically you know, commenting on the fact that it is actually here to stay and that audiences are, are also at the same time um, expecting these sorts of experiences, expecting um, basically any content or any story or any game to be available on more than one media platform. So that means that the lure of the shiny new thing doesn't really have much sway. I mean, I've seen over the last few years there have been projects that have been brought out and they've been funded or commissioned and it's basically been held up to a, to, to a standard of just basically being new. But it's only, only so long that that will actually last. What's needed is a consideration of what has come before and what actually sort of produces some quality. So are there some lessons that we can learn from those before there may be? Um, yes, there are. I mean, there are basically a lot of lessons, but should I list? <coughs> These are just some that I just quickly wrote down. I mean, I can basically go through a lot of um, sort of the details of, of the insights that have been developed from a lot of people who have been working in this area and from my own experience as well. But instead, I decided to basically weigh up talking about the lessons learned with what's really needed um, to know right now in terms of the area has changed. There have been a whole lot of different ways of um, applying the, the cross-media format in, in a lot of different forms. And now the practitioners have been responding to each other in their designs and been responding to what audiences have been saying and with the influence of financiers and all these sorts of pressures, it's come to the point now where, where there are certain sort of key issues that are, that are arising. So what I'll be talking about today then are just some of the, the key points that, that are basically an issue now. Pretty simple. Local and global, design documentation and addressing different audiences. So I'll basically outline those. So the issue of local and global. There has been, as, as, um, as you're aware and as um, Ted spoke about, there has been a rise of the live event and basically creating experiences where instead of just going to the cinema and watching the film, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a cinema event that's there. The gaming, street gaming, um, all of these have arisen in some way in response to the fact that content can easily be spread across a whole lot of different mediums. Now some people have said, oh, that means that the medium doesn't matter anymore. And in fact, the opposite has happened. The, uh, the medium and the experience has become, has heightened in value because people are more aware of the differences. But what's also happening is, of, of course, with the internet is that people can access all this information on a global scale. And, but what I've been seeing is local with this, a dash of global, if you like. Um, there's been, I think, an overemphasis on the live events. Because um, one of the issues with live events is scalability. There's only so many people who can actually turn up to do um, to do a game, uh, to go to to go to the cinema. 
And so here are sort of just brainstorming, you know, some of the ways that you could deal with this. One with live events, and these are sort of the, the pertinent issues that are coming out, is being able to share the experience in real time, so streaming it in some way, in some interesting way, giving non-local people something to do as well in terms of the design of a project. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of projects that have come out and, yeah, the emphasis on the live events, but they haven't really thought about the fact that the majority of the audience is global, they're online, they won't be able to turn up to the live events, and they don't necessarily give them things to do. Uh, getting local and non-local people to work together. You can use network technology and, and mobile technology, etc., to get them actually um, helping each other in the live events and in the um, online events. And this is another one, making the local um, replicatable by yourself or others. So on the one hand, we've got this notion sort of being explored with indie cinema and guerrilla drive-ins and things like that, where there's basically a, a structure there. Um, there are a lot of websites that have been developed in which anyone can sort of come in and they can uh, you know, download the film or find the film and they have this kit in which they can you know, create this live event. Um, but that's great. That means people can do it themselves. But there's also um, the issue of coming up with a particular uh, game-like experience or, or a particular event. And so we're seeing this notion of creating a rule set in terms of the actual experience of the game. And this is just an example from um, an alternate reality game called The Lost Ring, which was brought out um, as part of the Olympics. It was actually you know, commissioned by McDonald's, and Jane McGonigal worked on it. And what she did is she created this rules um, for a, a game-like experience. So basically, anyone could create this labyrinth game anywhere around the world. So instead of trying to put on all these live events yourself, basically the rule set was given to the players, and anyone could actuate it, anyone could film it, and then put online from any location. And there you have scalability. So that's just one method that's actually you know, out there. Another issue, obviously, is documentation. Having looked at uh, a lot of projects over the last few years and coming in as an analyst and, and as a judge, um, for a while I've been, been sort of saying, OK, well, do, do any method that you like. You know, ha have a bit of fun. But it's becoming more and more important that we need some standardisation, some system for actually talking about these uh, projects. And these are the most sort of pertinent issues that I've found sort of coming up. Is one that there's been no indication of what part of the story is in what, in what media. Um, so there's like a description of the story, but you're not quite sure what part of the story is experienced in what media. Um, timing, when each element is actually released, because this comes into the actual, the art of this practice in terms of pacing. When, do, when does this piece bit of information is released, how much time is there between that and the next one, is there a rhythm to the release, um, how much participation is demanded at a certain period of time, do they have a break in participation, and so on. Um, in, uh, no indication of the why and how part um, participants um, traverse media, so basically communicating why they're actually going to go to the web, why would they go to a live event, why would they then go and buy this, what is the call to action that's driving them across there and their motivation and obviously then their reward. Um, what people see and do, their actual experience of it, um, basically, you know, will they be sitting in a room and, um, and talking on the telephone? There's so much, there's been a lot of emphasis on the content and basically saying it will be available on this device or, or here or there. But there needs to be more of a, an understanding of what the actual experience is like for the person. They haven't thought about non-linear traversal in terms of what order the actual narrative is traversed. I've seen a lot of documentation that basically outlines all the bits of the narrative, um, but they haven't thought about the fact that um, that that prequel is actually accessed afterwards. Um, and so it, it sort of doesn't make sense in terms of the narrative. And of course, one of the difficulties that's been arising is ensuring continuity across different developers. If you are collaborating with a lot of, a lot of people, one of the issues is how do you get everyone on the same page in terms of the, vis the vision and the passion for it? So 
these are sort of three um, <coughs> three documentation types that have that have basically been emerging uh, to answer a lot of those questions. One is a universe guide, which is which is basically you know developed from the show Bible, which is um, common in television shows, and in which they outline items like this, like this for Battlestar Galactica, in which you find out a whole lot of information about the characters and all the different um, storylines that are there, um, the history of the place, the technology. And from that, um, with these TV guides, is writers can come in at any time and actually know what is the, um, what's the whole world about, what's um, all the backgrounds, all that critical information. So these, that's this system is now being used in cross media. So rather than being specific for TV, they're actually creating um, documentation for for basically the world and how it will actually play play across a whole lot of media. But there's also the issue of participation is a strong part of these sorts of projects. And so there's an influence coming from gaming and game design documentation um, in which <coughs> For game design documents, they have the, a very similar practice in terms of describing the world and all of the characters, but then they're also, of course, describing what people do, how they actually influence the world, what sort of activities they can actually, they can actually take part in. And so this is just a, a, you know, a screenshot of um, some of the aspects of a, of a game design document. It's called Top Secret, but it's not really. Um, so I'm not, I'm not revealing anything. Um, Okay, yes, yeah, so as I said, the, the current context, you've got your show Bible and you've got your game design document and now it's basically changing in the cross-media contents to being a, a Bible that ensures continuity across media platforms rather than just one and, to, and discussing uh, participation across media platforms as well. And so here's just a sketch of of some of the items that you would include in a universe guide in which you're describing you're describing the world that you're creating above the medium, um, and so basically, what are the characters there? What are, what's the uh, what's the backstory? Um, the platforms, how it will roll out, what aspects of participation, um, and what's specific also to each media platform, and how you will actually bring that out. Um, so we've got synopsis, and then at the end, as you can see here the universe future. Now this is an element that actually is being utilised in these documentation is they're not just documenting what has, what is planned um, to actually be created, but they're also documenting the possibilities of what could be explored. You know, what are the sub-characters um, that are there? What are the stories that have been hinted on but have not necessarily been um, explored yet? Um, characters and participation points. Now that is one of the method methods that they're using for helping guide other uh, people who will be producing other aspects of your production, if you're not doing everything yourself, to sort of guide them into a direction of where they can actually go. And this is, helps change the frame of mind into one in which you're thinking about uh, not just, as I said, a single story, but basically or all of the permutations that could actually take place. And within that document is, if you see um, in there, is like a, a flow visualisation, which is common in gaming. It's common in um, the early years of interactive storytelling with um, CD-ROM storytelling and things like that, uh, and also web design. It's this notion of a flow visualisation. Now, this is a joke um, one um, from, from gaming, which has been around for for a while, and so it's here. It's just showing a decision tree um, of what someone will do as they're actually going through. But now, with flow um, visualizations, you're now taking it to the cross-media context. Um, and so here's just an old one that's um, been around for a for a while. This is from an alternate reality game called The Beast, um, which came out in 2001. The um, the prototypical ARG. And, and here you can see, I mean, you know, just some, some guidelines. You've got the, you know, the uh, audience enters via the movie poster, for instance, and they go to a, a web page, and then they can be guided to a phone um, or to another web page. And here it sort of documents in colours in terms of the, um, how hard levels of how hard the clues are and therefore the splintering of the audiences. 
Uh, now these are, have uh, developed since then, but that just gives you a, a guide as to what people are actually thinking about when they're talking about the flow visualisation. That actually helps the design process because it helps to basically um, understand have you created bridges, have you created links between all the content. There's a lot of people who are creating lots of bits of content all over the place but they haven't really thought about how the audience actually moves through. And it helps uh, communicate the project to other people and interested parties that you may be dealing with. Um, and I was just, at, I was at actually the uh, British Library the other day and they had all, all these sort of, you know, ancient, not ancient, but old, old documentations of musical scores and things like that and, and talking about these great, great pieces of work that, have, that are now archived. And for me, I, I work on these charts and I see some of these charts as, as being obviously very important to the design process and something that can influence the end product. I mean, sometimes they even design it according to a particular shape or structure. And I like the idea, I like the idea that maybe in the future, you know, there are some sort of charts that you can look at and you can see how beautiful it is in terms of the way they thought out the choreography and the pacing and the experience uh, and how they've actually designed it. And I'd like to think that one day <laughs> there might be flowcharts in a library um, somewhere. But there's another aspect that's also emerging in terms of uh, scripting. And all of these issues and documentations are ones that help you understand um, with, with your design process, but also communicating it to other people. And in terms of a guideline for how this occurs, I look back to um, Terminator and um, James Cameron, who, when he worked on Terminator 3. For James Cameron, the Terminator 3 movie was actually in a, um, oh, I wouldn't call it a fun park ride, a th um, thrill, thrill, um, thrill ride, whatever, at Universal Studios. And for, for him, that was where the, um, the third story came from. My point is here, his script. As you can see here, we've got the, the usual uh, methods that one uses in, in an actual script, but what he is describing here is the experience of the person who is walking through the street of Universal Studios and the things that they will see. So it's written from the perspective of the audience, from the player. And this gives us an indication of actually, you know, a shift in documentation and taking the flow chart to another level and actually documenting the flow experience in script form. So I can see this actually emerging as well. Okay, another important point is varying engagement um, levels and skills, addressing different audiences. This is, uh, this is actually quite a, a crucial point because um, this is this is a uh, graph from 42 Entertainment. They put this up a few years ago, in which they were documenting the different audiences, uh, the different audience levels that that they noticed. And this is repeated across a, a lot of different um, gaming environments. They often find that there are sort of three levels, at least three levels, um, of users. Always, you know, the people who are casually just involved, the people who are active, and the people who are enthusiastic. Now, this is this is pertinent um, to the cross media area. Because what's been happening over the last few years is at the beginning, at the beginning there was a, um, an emphasis on the enthusiastic, on an addressing people by having lots of content and really hard to find and spread across a whole lot of different media. And, and that was fantastic. What they were finding was, of course, the majority of the audience weren't engaging across the media at all. Um, and and they were trying to figure out ways that they could actually make sure that you engage the casual more. So there's been this shift in the other direction towards making these sort of cross-media experience, experiences highly accessible. And so they've been emphasizing looking at the um, newcomers, the visitors, um, the novices that are actually entering these works. And so you've seen a lot of projects like this. This is an early Australian one in the early 2000s where you have representations of the media you don't actually go to the other media platforms, you have representations of them that, the, that you then click on. And we can see this over and over again with a lot of projects um, in which you basically have all these clickable elements which represent the media. You don't actually go across a lot of different media platforms. <clears throat> now, 
what is crucial and important is that you're not just addressing the newcomers all the time that you are also addressing your regulars, your, your hardcore, the people that are continually coming back um, to, to your actual project. And this has actually been done with, in, with a few techniques and uh, I'll just explain um, some of them here. This is from Last Call Poker in which they actually had like an, an online game um, that people could actually participate in as well as having the sort of the hardcore alternate reality game underneath. The same with Chain Factor. Um, this was an alternate reality game that was um, connected with a television show with numbers and Area Code created this online game which is still incredibly popular um, today, it's just a single medium um, element that people can actually engage with, but underneath that was a whole lot of complex, complex play. And the same with Six to Start, the uh, UK uh, production company, and they created these works in which they were sort of highly accessible on the, the top layer, all these sort of interactive stories, but underneath there, you know, there was an actual alternate reality game sort of triggered by the, the little rabbit underneath there. And so here's just a sort of a, a representation of, of the different audiences and, and basically how important it, it is to actually design for all these different audiences. So you've got your accessibility and appealing to the um, majority. You create an expanded world in terms of people aren't necessarily uh, participating a lot and interacting, but they can explore the world across a whole lot of different um, across a whole lot of different websites, just looking at websites, finding out more about characters, etc. And then there are those who could delve even further into the interactivity and finding specific skills. And then of course you've got your creative hardcore, which are your smallest area, but they're the ones that create content, which then feed back to the whole life cycle there. Um, it's, yeah, well, I mean, why is this important? Basically, you need to attract and reach more people, um, that more people stick around when you've actually given them a variety of things to do, that they can casually engage with some elements or they can, if they choose to, they can engage with some, um, some more intensive elements. The hardcore are the smallest um, audience size, but the most engaged, um, and the casuals are the largest, but the least experienced. But as I say, you can only create what you know. Um, so if you don't actually understand the hardcore, you'll need to actually find uh, people that you can actually work with. So just quickly, bonus level, another couple of items that I'll add to these sorts of lessons. One, I think what we'll see over the, over the next few years is, is more of an understanding of how important it is to consider the physicality of all the different mediums. You know, what is it like to flick a book and then to change to go into the cinema and then to change to actually um, watching something on television um, and to run out in the street. They'll actually be thinking more about that choreography of, of the experience for people. But also here, there's been an incredible emphasis on creating cross-media projects that are before the release, you know, before a new, uh, new season of a television show, um, before an, um, a cinema release, before a DVD release. Now that's understandable because it's had, you know, a promotional emphasis, but what I think it's important for creators to do is not just think of it as promotion, but think about actually what is right for the film, what's right for the story, what's right for your message, and, and basically design an experience for all that. I don't know about you, but whenever I see a film, it's straight afterwards is the time when I actually want to engage with more content. Um, and so I'd like to see the sort of the shift from that paradigm to there. So I just, I just put in this little slide here, you know, I dare you to think about what is right for the film, for the story, for the characters, for the mood, for your message. Put your creativity in a healthy dollop of audience demand first, and then let's see what the next generation of cross media brings. Thank you. Questions? Any thoughts? This one down here. Hello, uh, Nicolas Brie. As everyone understands, I'm French because of the accent. Uh, I lead the Transmedia Lab, uh, which is a, an orange initiative in France and a, a young brother of the Power to the Pixel organization. Um, my question is that uh, you've m talked about uh, very engagement and skills, interaction, participation. Uh, do you have in mind also a third step, which is 
building the community uh, which uh, is based on interaction and interactivity, but also on other uh, uh, possibilities for the for the um, uh, for the digital uh, spectator. So, uh, do, I, do I include community in that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because oh, oh. you may have a, a program on the internet which is really interactive. You like it, but you're single. There is no community. So it's uh, I see it in another um, perspective. Yeah, well, that's probably just a, a, a paradigm thing or um, just in terms of terminology. But, yeah, any participation, whether it be engaging with people or with um, interacting with the content in some way or creating content, I'm just talking in general terms about giving different things for people to do. There's a whole lot of specifics and there's a whole lot of techniques and there's a whole variety, a, a range of ways that you can actually implement that. Yeah. It's not because you're interacting that you're part of the community. Yes. It's not because you are interacting with, uh, for example, playing on a game uh, on a website that you are part of a community. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking just interacting with the content. I'm just saying activity in general. Yeah, yeah. Another question? Hi. Um, the gentleman who spoke earlier, Mr. Hope, um, said some really insightful things about how we're moving from a model of sort of um, where the studios have sort of command and control um, structures around green lighting, making, producing, marketing content to something that's much more democratic. But you're talking about a world where there needs to be so much coordination across so many different media types so much continuity in the storyline that is it the opposite and the studios actually are going to have more power than ever before because they can coordinate and integrate all that stuff under one roof. What's happening is there has always been, I mean, you look at the franchise model that, that's been before, I mean, basically the way it used to be run was that the people who develop all the different um, uh, content and all the different media there was they were completely isolated there was no contact between them at all but now what's happening is that the original creators um, are actually either one doing it themselves um, working you know a, a lot across writing and directing all these elements across the media platforms um, or they're they're working very closely uh, it's actually the creators you know the writers and the producers and that are the ones who are ensuring continuity uh, and these documents are created by those. It isn't, um, it isn't actually other, other people who are ensuring the continuity because the paradigm is that this is all part of the actual creative project. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. <laughs> I think we have to, yeah. A quick one? Yes, a quick one. Yeah, just, just a practical question. Those lessons learned, are, are they, can you tell us roughly, uh, uh, they're learned from how many projects exactly? And are, are they learned, not exactly, but roughly? And um, are they all cases that you've been aware of all coming from Anglo-Saxon countries? No. Yeah, no, not, not at all. Um, I know I've, I've been looking across uh, basically how cross-media has been uh, emerging uh, around the world. I, I, I concentrate on, on English speaking, obviously, because that's, that's my uh, main area of conversation. But, but I, do, I do deal with um, practitioners and study their works in a lot of different countries. So I've been looking you know, at Brazil and, and Sweden and the Netherlands and, um, and Finland um, and, and France and obviously the UK and the USA and Australia. And there's uh, projects that are emerging in Japan um, and some experimentations in, in China and that, but it's mainly the Asian ones that I'm not in, entirely on top of. But no, it's not specific to, um, no, it's not, it's not specific to Anglo-Saxon, but there are cultural differences, most definitely. Um, and there are cultural differences in, in terms of the way that this, that, uh, the expectations and the awareness and the knowledge of these things. And this is where if you're creating projects, especially global projects, that there has to be an understanding of 
of basically those differences and how it has to be designed differently. Um, you know, wasn't able to go into that detail uh, today, but but yeah. How many how many projects? This is based on me looking at the last um, ten years and looking at oh, I guess 150 different projects um, across a whole lot of different media art forms. I mean, that's basically what I do is I immerse myself in creative projects that are happening across in a whole lot of different uh, creative industries and and look at and look at what's what are the trends that are actually arising. Um, in terms of uh, practitioner approaches. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, we should finish. Thank you.